Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, by popular demand, the RCA Pierre Monteux box, which came out like a long time ago before this channel existed and went out of print before this channel existed, a long time before this channel existed, but it seems to be back. Um, I checked on Amazon. It's available. It's, it's out there for those of you who want it. The question is, should you get it? And as always, I have to say, there is a separate box, a small box of the Pierre Monta stereo recordings um, on RCA, which you should definitely have because, you know, those are all in here. If you want the earlier stuff, well, that's a collector's edition. Um, and you have to be able to tolerate some pretty grotty historical sonics. Um, and also, you know, well, there are better performances of most of the stuff that was recorded in pretty grotty um, sonics. However, from a historical point of view, this is important stuff. And if you are a student of history, of the history of these works and recording, then Pierre Monta is one of those conductors you have to follow. Because, you know, he was born in 18, I think around 1876, somewhere in the 1870s. He died in the 1960s. He lived to make stereo recordings of some of his basic repertoire. He played in a string quartet for Brahms himself. I mean, really, it's kind of remarkable. He is a direct connection to the late Romantic period, as as were Toscanini and, you know, some other conductors from the same period. Uh, but uh, he was just a tremendous conductor, an orchestra trainer, an all-around um, incredibly musical guy. And his interpretation, some of them are reference recordings. We'll be getting to some of those, of course. And it, just generally speaking, he is worth getting to know. He led the premieres of so much important music. Daphnis and Chloe, The Rite of Spring, Petrushka. It really, like, yeah, he was there. He knew everybody, everybody there was to know. He knew how the music should be played. He is a wonderful example to those morons in the historical performance universe who are trying to tell us that they know how the music would have sounded back in the day when the people who actually made the music sound back in the day lived to make it sound again in stereo. And so we know, you know, fascinating selective historical memory. He is a living testament to performance practice. And when you think about it, you know, I find fascinating about conductors like Monteux and Toscanini and a couple of others who lived into the stereo era, um, is that when they were born in the 1860s and 70s, you know, Beethoven had been dead for 40 years, 50 years. That's it. And so, you know, we, we, we have our memory, our collective memory about music history is is rather, rather short. And because our own lifespans are limited. We tend to think of things as happening way, way back in the past, but that's so not true. When you consider that Monta's stereo legacy is really just a couple of generations away from a couple of generations of conductors, not 20 year generations, but you know, provenance, generational legacy type things. I mean, it's just a couple of generations away from Beethoven and thus Mozart and Haydn and those people going back. It's not a long time. It really isn't. Um, and that's why I find some of these recordings so fascinating. But anyway, there was a lot of music he did that was a little bit unusual or off the beaten track for the time, um, which was also wonderful. And most of the performances here are very good. I mean, the San Francisco Symphony, when he got them, was a little scruffy. Um, he de-scruffed them a bit. Um, they were always a little bit scruffy, but not in any sort of bad way. And it, let's just go through it, shall we? I mean, we're going to just let me let me do it this way. There are how many discs? I think it's like 40 or so. There we go. Got it out. First challenge is opening the box. Then when we get to yes, disc number, how many discs are there? CD 40. Well, 39 with a bonus CD. Um, his 80th birthday interview. He's actually a charming guy. He's interesting to hear about and then to talk about. So I, I actually listened to that. It was fun. So here we go. Oh, there he is. He looks so French, doesn't he? He was French. He was also Jewish, which I think is kind of fascinating. Uh, okay, let's get to this, shall we? Maybe I'm Track listing. Here's the track listing. And we begin with early recordings. 
His earlier recording started in 1941. And some of these things are really, really dim sounding, some of these earlier songs, because, you know, the San Francisco Symphony was recorded and on mics that were relayed to like Los Angeles or something. It was some nutty setup and it was during the war. And, uh, you know, you have to have reasonable expectations. Some things sound better than others, of course, but by 19, late 40s, early 50s, everything was sounding decent mono and you were sort of in pretty good shape. So we begin with La Valls by Ravel, a bit of Rimsky-Korsakov's Le Coq d'Or, the, the wedding procession, and the Vincent Dandy Symphony on a French Mountain Air. Yay, love that. Now, I mean, this will come out as Mountain Year or something in the subtitles, French Mountain Air, as in tune, the tune. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. <laughs> That's the tune. And, oh God, what a great piece that is that no one plays. And the Franck D minor. Well, the Franck D minor was, of course, a, a calling card piece for Monta, who attended the premiere in 1888. He was 12. And he was there at the premiere, the riotous premiere, and lived to make several recordings of it. So there you are. All right, so that's CD1. CD2, um, the orchestration of the Franck Pièce Héroïque, which is fun to hear, um, Debussy's Gigue and Ronde de Printemps, and the Vincent Dandy Symphony No. 2. Now, in 1940-something, when this was done, 1941 or 42? 42, 42. I mean, people did not listen to the Dandy Second Symphony, which is a, a sort of um, older and not necessarily wiser version of the Franck. It's, it's a wonderful work, but... It's it fascinating, you know, I mean, that these pieces were being recorded then. And they had the catalog to themselves, obviously. Um, and then we've got Samrinsky Korsakov, The March from the Tale of Tsar Sultan, and Lalo's Le Roi Dix Overture. All of these things were rarities. This is all with the San Francisco Symphony. And then we've got uh, disc three. Here we go. Lalo, Symphony Espanol, the whole thing. It's not missing a movement, as it often was, with Yehudi Menuhin, the young, young Yehudi Menuhin, well, youngish. Yehudi Menuhin, and the Brook Concerto Number no. 1. So those are good to have when Menuhin was still playing well. Uh, CD4, Berlioz, the Overture to Benvenuto Cellini, and Les Troyens à Carthage, Prélude. That's fun. Dandy's Istar. This is how I learned Istar. I mean, this is one of the, you know, recordings that was out back in the day. You know, you could get it historically. It was out. Um, and Berlioz, Symphony Fantastique. Probably his best recording of that, actually, all things considered. I mean, he did some others, and they were a little droopy. This is not. This is exciting. It's wonderful. Um, it really has has drive. More dandy on disc five. The prelude on disc five. The prelude to Ferval, which is you know, Parsifal. Parsifal. Parsifal goes to the bistro. Parsifal in France. It's, I think, virtually unlistenable. Um, it's so Wagnerian that Wagner would be spinning. And then Rimsky-Korsakov's Sadko um, Suite, which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful piece. Um, and I wish we could like hear the whole thing more frequently because it's terrific music. The Brahms Alto Rhapsody. Um, let's see, who's, who's the, he's, he did that a couple times. Let's see which alto he's got in this one. Marian Anderson. Yes, that's the one. Marian Anderson and the Sacre du Printemps with San Francisco Symphony. Now, of course, there's the Boston one, which is probably his best one overall. Um, this is not bad. Um, it's certainly better than his his uh, Paris Conservatory Orchestra Stravinsky recordings, which are just gruesomely awful. Uh, really kind of shocking. Absolutely shocking. It's kind of fun to have the Brahms Alto Rhapsody and the Stra Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring on the same disc. Maybe you should play them simultaneously. Uh, what else have we got? Brahms, Second Symphony. Well, that was one of his calling cards as well. Um, Brahms is his favorite composer. It's a crime that he didn't make a complete Brahms cycle in stereo because he was a great Brahms conductor and he was one of the guys who was there when, you know, Brahms was there. It would have been nice. Um, and then we've got more. Rimsky-Korsakov, Wedding Procession. I guess he liked that a lot. Um, this is the longer version of it, you know, from the beginning. Um, the other one was the abridged version. Then we've got CD7, Darius Mio, Sweet Symphonique Number no. 2. When was the last time you heard that? Chausson's Poem with uh, Yasha Heifetz, not too shabby. And Louis Grunberg, his violin concerto, also with Yasha Heifetz. Uh, it's a good work. I wonder why we don't hear that anymore. 
It's really a delightful piece. Uh, CD8, Ebers Escal, Ports of Call, Rimsky Korsakov's Antar Symphony. I mean, these were just novelties, wonderful novelties back in 19, what was this now? 40 something or other. I mean, it's got dates here. Um, if I wish I could see the dates. Did they give you the dates? Original releases. Yes, here they are. They tell you what the numbers were, and but I don't see dates here. Well, it's probably it's just me. And then we've got the Ravel Vals Noble et Sentimental. Oh, here we go. Dates. 46, 48. Four, no, 46. 1946. And Daphnis and Chloe Suite number one. And DBC's Sarah Band from Pour le Piano, arranged by Ravel. Um, CD9, Strauss's Ein Heldenleben. It's not as good as like the Mengelberg Ein Heldenleben with New York Phil. It actually doesn't even sound as good as that one did. Um, but it... You know, it, it's not it, it's not bad. I mean, it's lively. It's not boring. Um, it's just a little bit clogged up, and and there are better Heldenleben's flitting about. Um, Chabrier's Fête Polonaise from Le Roi Malgré Lui, and CD Ten Scriabin, the poem of ecstasy. Now, the poem of extase. Pardon me. Let's do it in French. The poem of extase, le poem d'extase, really needs great sound, of course because it's just kind of chromatic sludge without it. Um, the Gounod Faust ballet music, and then bits of Mendelssohn, Ravel, El Borada, um, the Roy Blas overture, the Benvenuto Cellini overture again, the Damnation of Faust, Hungarian March, picture of orchestra. There they all are, looking happy as a clam, playing for Le Maître, as Monteau was known. Uh, and let's see, oh, Scheherazade. This is from 1950. This is a good Scheherazade. It's probably a little bit better than his later remake for the LSO, although that was very good too. But this is exciting. It's really exciting. It's a, and it sounds good. I mean, it's, it's in decent mono sound, so it's tolerable. Beethoven Symphony Number no. 2, also surprisingly good. I mean, he didn't do a lot of Beethoven symphonies in this early period, and I'm very happy for that. Frankly, I would rather have Dan D and the other stuff. Then we've got another Franck symphony in D minor. Yes, there's another. Um, you know, because we're talking about, you know, better sound and, and you know, long playing things and magnetic tape and the usual technological innovations. So there's the other Franck symphony, the second of three, and another symphony fantastique, which is also quite exciting and decent. Um, it's actually a little bit a little bit more raunchy in the finale than his previous one. Uh, it's a surprisingly exciting performance. Um, so that's wonderful. And then we've got another Sacre du Printemps. This is the Boston one. Yes, there's the Boston one on CD 15. That's the whole disc, I guess. And another Brahms II with San Francisco from 1951. Beautiful performance. These are just fresh, lively, exciting, musical, you, transparent in terms of texture. They always move. They're supple. Supple is the word. Souplesse. They have souplesse, which is not usually a quality associated with Brahms, but they never sound clunky and heavy and, you know, Germanic or Teutonic or whatever you want to call them. Uh, the Chausson Symphony, that was a novelty back in 1950. Um, and the Alto Rhapsody again with Marian Anderson, who was not in as good voice for this one as she was in the previous one, and her famous recording of Mahler's Kindertoten Leader. Um, let's see, one of them, let's see, the Alto Rhapsody is with Reiner, and the Kindertoten Leader are with Monteux. And then we've got Debussy's Complete Image, this time including Iberia um, with San Francisco, and that's lots of fun. Uh, Brahms' Schicksal's Lead, and then Bach, Passacaglia, and Fugue in C Minor, transcribed by Respighi. That was a novelty. Um, and the bit of the Christmas Oratorio, the Sinfonia, Beethoven's Ruins of Athens Overture. Let's see, CD21, Beethoven Fourth Symphony. Another lovely performance, it really is. And Schumann's Fourth. This is amazing. It's one of the great Schumann performances anybody ever did, ever, ever, ever. His Schumann was always great. It really was. It's It's terrific. Absolutely terrific. Um, then we've got another poem of ecstasy. Well, it sounds a little better. This is with Boston um, and Les Preludes. Um, and that's always fun. It's from 1952, and it was recorded in Carnegie Hall. It sounds decent. Mozart Piano Concertos 12 and 18 with Lily Krauss and the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Lovely performances of those. Uh, Chausson, the poem de la mort et de la mer, a real novelty in those days. 
um, sung by Gladys Swarthout quite well. Um, and bits of Berlioz, Rinaldo Hahn, uh, Debussy, Duparc, you know, songs and, and things like that. And Poulenc, Poulo Poulenc, Ben Alité, a couple of those, and Les Chemins d'Amour, all with, with uh, let's see, who's singing all this? Yeah, Gladys Swarthout is singing. And she's accompanied by the orchestra sometimes and pianos and other people at other times. Then we've got a Beethoven Eighth. Um, Beethoven Eighth. Yes, he did all like the, the other Beethovens in this pile, not the heavy-duty ones, like I said. I mean, and when he did get to the heavy-duty ones, he really did a very fine job of them. I mean, he did, no question about that. So we've got a decent Beethoven Eighth and the uh, Respighi, Bach, Pasacaglia, and Fugue in C minor, again. And the Berlioz, Benvenuto Cellini Overture, again. Uh, Delib, Silvia, and Coppelia Ballet Suites, including the Coppelia Prelude and Mazurka. Oh, I love that. Oh, my God, that's great. You get it twice, actually, here. Um, with members of the Boston Symphony. Debussy, La Mer, and the Nocturnes. Um, with the Boston Symphony. Now, La Mer was recorded in stereo, but the tape got, went missing. And so they give you um, the first four minutes of the first movement in stereo, all that survives of the stereo tape. But it sounds fine in mono. It's wonderful performances. They really are. Then we've got La Traviata. Uh, now, nobody much cared for this Traviata. It's with Rosanna Cartieri, Carteri, pardon me, as Violetta, and Cesare Valete as Alfredo, and Leonard Warren as Giorgio Germont, and lots of other people. Um, it's with the, the chorus and orchestra of the Opera of Rome. Uh, the problem with this performance, let's put it this way, and it's in stereo too, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm sure it is, um, is was that it, it, just, it just sounds, well, it's just not red-blooded enough. I mean, they don't like scream and shriek and die. And you want them to scream, scream and shriek and die. I, I'm not saying that, you know, Carteri here doesn't, you know, try. She does. But she was no, well, Maria Callas or um, Kotrubash, who we heard later with Kleiber or, or even Anna Moffo or Caballé or, or, or Sutherland. Or, you know, there were just better singers out there doing it. Um, and the same thing goes the same thing with the cast. The cast is okay. But, and, well, let's just say it's a second-rate Traviata. Sorry. Then we've got Tchaikovsky. Oh, Symphony 6, 5, and, well, 4 shows up somewhere, just not yet. These are with Boston. These Tchaikovsky performances are classics, absolute classics. They are effortless and tasteful and exciting and passionate and wonderfully played and glowingly recorded and living stereo and... They're in that stereo box that I mentioned, so you absolutely have to have them. Uh, the Cacciatorian Violin Concerto and the Sanson Habanez with Leonid Kogan and the Boston Symphony. People tend to forget about this recording for some reason, mostly because people tend to forget about Cacciatorian, probably for obvious reasons. But this was really, really good. It's wonderful. Then the Brahms Violin Concerto with, with Henrik Schering in the London Symphony, a beautiful performance that everybody screams at me because I don't mention it when I do my my Brahms concerto summaries. I mean, Schering did it more than once also, but um, it's it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely, and so I'm making it up now. If you like Schering and you like the Brahms Violin Concerto, you should hear that. And with Monta, anything he did with Brahms is important. Then here's the Tchaikovsky Fourth we talked about, Stravinsky's Petrushka, a knockout, an absolute knockout. Boston Symphony Orchestra, um, and it's totally wonderfully fabulous really amazingly fabulous. It's, it's just terrific. Um, and we've got the complete Orfeo ed Eurydice. This is better on the whole than the Traviata as an opera performance. I'm still not totally thrilled with, with Montu's way with it, especially in Que Faro Senzo Eurydice, you know, where, where the articulation, now you look at what Gluck wrote, you see the articulation and he sort of seems to do what Gluck wanted, but doesn't, somehow it doesn't work. With the violins going, ee, jing, ee, jing, ee, jing. It's, it's mechanical sounding. It's odd. But there's some very good singing. There really is. The, the cast is Risa Stevens, Lisa De La Casa, and Roberta Peters, and they're really good. They're all really good. It's good to hear Risa Stevens, you know, in one of her big roles. And, you know, Lisa De La Casa is always wonderful. So that was good. Then we've got Strauss, Death and Transfiguration, and Wagner's Siegfried Podel. I mean, Idol. 
And oh, these are good performances. My gosh, they're great. Death and Transfiguration is just a knockout. I, I've talked to you about it before. It's thrilling, absolutely thrilling and exciting and smartly done and wonderfully paced. And the Siegfried Idyll is great because it's less than 17 minutes long. And the quicker you do it, the better it sounds. That's for damn sure. Then on CD 39, the last but not least, that wonderful, fabulous, valedictory Franck D minor with the Chicago Symphony, which is the reference recording for the Franck D minor. We will talk about it in another video, I'm sure, at some point in the future, just to make sure everybody knows about it. Because it's one of the greatest recordings of anything anyone ever did. And as I said, Monteux, it was a living link to Cesar Franck himself, which I just find totally cool. I mean, it's the coolest thing in the world. So there you have it, friends. Um, 40 discs, 39 of music, one interview, and a really important chunk of a really important legacy. There's more variety here than in his Decca, later Decca recordings in London. The orchestras are somewhat better. I mean, San Francisco, of course, you know, became pretty good, um, starting out average-ish, but he trained them. The Boston Symphony was magnific magnificent. So yeah, there it is. It's back. And if you didn't get it and you're a historical recording collector and you don't mind, like I said, sitting through some pretty iffy sound for the first half of the box, more or less, um, then sure, grab it if you could afford it and, um, this time around because we never know when it's coming back. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.